I had a great opportunity back in January to do something I've never had the chance to do yet, and that was to speak at a conference that my pastor was at. And both Pastor Chapel and I, that was the very first time we'd ever preached together uh, at the same uh, conference. And I sat on the front row to hear my pastor, and it was really special because I thought to myself as I sat there, I said, you know, I know at Lancaster Baptist Church, sometimes pastor goes out in different times and he's got so many things going on. And, and, I, and I know you think sometimes, you know, maybe it would just be better if he just stayed here a little bit more, whatever. I want you to know one of the great privileges of going to this church is the influence that this church has in our country and in our world. And I want to tell you something. We are blessed to be able to have a pastor that is wanted to, be spoke, to speak at other places and a pastor that has the vision that he does for this world. Now listen, Lancaster Baptist, that's our pastor in Manila, along with m much of the church staff. That means, you know what that means? That means we're in Manila too. And that means that we're a part of everything going on there. Back in the 1600s and 1700s, there was a group of people called the Moravians. They lived in a place called Hernhut, and Count Zinzendorf was their leader. And this was what they did. They went out everywhere in the world. Some of them sold themselves into slavery to reach the slaves in the fields of Jamaica and Bahamas and different areas like that. Some of them reached to the Jewish people. At that point in history, nobody was reaching the Jewish people but the Moravians. And the big deal was in Hernhut, nobody wanted to stay in Hernhut. Everyone wanted to go out in the world, but they had to stay for prayer, for supplies, for needed things. Those uh, saints that stayed back uh, in the home uh, so to speak, to hold the ropes for the missionaries that went out. And you know what? That's what we need to do with our pastor and our church staff this week is hold the ropes. I, throughout the course of the week, I kept on thinking like, well, I'd like to be there. But you know what? The Lord has us here right now to hold those ropes and to reach Antelope Valley for Jesus Christ. If you've got your Bibles, take them and turn to Matthew chapter number 11. So, after they told me that I was speaking on Sunday, February 25th, a little bit later on, I received an email and said, we would like to have you continue with Pastor's series that he will have started the week before. And that was Jesus Is. And in the email, it said that he's going to preach on Jesus Is Eternal God. And it was interesting. I have never preached on this topic before. I have preached on the humility of Christ and his humiliation, but I had never preached on him, Jesus is meek and lowly. But it was interesting when I read that email and it said, the first week, Jesus is eternal God. And I'm just telling you, immediately, I just thought, Jesus is meek and lowly too. The contrast of Jesus is eternal God, but Jesus is meek and lowly. And I couldn't even Actually, I couldn't even remember, right, I knew it was somewhere in the scriptures, but I couldn't even remember, like, where is that? Well, here's where it is. Matthew chapter 11, we begin reading the last three verses of this chapter. And I want to tell you something about this passage of scripture. Number one, if I could give three verses to the United States of America right now, I want you to know, these are my three verses for this country. If I could give you three verses for the state of California and for Antelope Valley, I'm telling you right now, there has never been a time this state needs these three verses more than right now. But I want to tell you something else about these three verses. No person has ever lived on planet Earth that can say, what Jesus Christ said in these three verses. Confucius could never have stood up and said Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Buddha, you don't have a chance to say what Jesus said in this passage. My friend, I will tell you, Mohammed never could come close to say what Jesus said in these three verses. There has never been anyone that has lived in the last 6,000 years on planet Earth that could say Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, except for one. And his name is Jesus. 
I'd like to have you stand as we read these three verses together. I'll read them out loud. You read them in your heart. And friend, I just want you to know this is the greatest invitation. This is not an invitation to a program. This is not an invitation to a scholarship or to education. This is not an, uh, an invitation to a material blessing. This is an invitation to the greatest need that every human being has that can only be filled by the Son of God in our life. Matthew 11, verse 28, the Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, we pray for a land that does not need a program or a law. We pray for a land that needs a person in Jesus Christ. We pray for a state that does not need more aid, but needs salvation in Jesus Christ. What an invitation. May we share the invitation of Jesus Christ to all mankind. For those, our friends, our loved ones, our church staff and our pastor, who's in Manila and in Asia. Lord, may they open up the invitation of Jesus to that great part of planet Earth and may many decisions be made. But today, Father, we're at the homeland. We're in our home church. We're in Lancaster, California. And I pray today that Jesus would be lifted up. Last week we heard he is the eternal God. Today, Father, may we see him as meek and lowly, for God became flesh. Father, I know he's coming back, and when your son comes back, it will not be the same way that he lived on this earth for 33 and a half years. May we understand, may we see what Christ taught us, may we understand our Savior. And Father, I pray today, that we will learn from him because he is meek and lowly of heart. Father, thank you for a meek and lowly Savior because that's what we needed. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. And God's children said, Amen. you may be seated. Whenever I come to a word, a phrase, or whatever, I immediately think, what does it mean? Meekness. We've heard the word, we've used the word, and probably for the majority of us, as I was when I began the study of this a couple weeks ago, probably the majority, the, the, all of us have heard the statement, meekness is not weakness. And we've heard that, <coughs> excuse me, and we've said that, but what in the world does that mean? He is meek and lowly in heart. So how does that describe, as we continue our series on Jesus is, last week, the eternal God, the omnipotent, omnipresent, Jesus is God, and we learned that last week. This week, almost seeming like a complete contrast, Jesus is meek and lowly. Well, for me, sometimes... Some item helps me sometimes understand things. I look at life as an object lesson. So I have two today. I have one here. It's a nozzle to a hose. This is kind of my jet nozzle. If I'm trying to get stuff off the concrete or whatever, and it's powerful, I use this little nozzle right here. And you put that on the end of a hose with water coming out of it. It really is powerful. We have one little bit of grass in our entire yard, about the size of our thing, and we do everything we can to keep it, and the rabbits do everything to eat it. 
but I have one little sprinkler. And this little sprinkler takes care of that little piece of grass. Now the hose that this goes on can be the same hose that this goes on. Matter of fact, it is. I take the attachment off, I use this around the concrete, clean it up around the porch or the pool or whatever. Then I use this to water the lawn. The PSA of water is the same that's coming out of this, that's coming out of this. But this is interesting. This takes that same pressure, that same power, for our Savior did not lose his deity when he became a man. He's the, he was God for 33 and a half years while he had on human form. But what did he do? Sometimes we say he limited himself. I don't mind that term because in a way, that's what this does. It limits the water to a certain area to water it. If I use this attachment to water my lawn, it would destroy the lawn. By the way, the Son of God is coming back. And the next time he comes back, it's not going to be this. It's going to be this. But I want you to understand, the meekness of God is like power under control. His meekness is not his weakness. It's not even kind of, well, he's, you know, Jesus was meek, he kind of a little bit of Billy Mouse. No, no. His meekness is incredible power and strength that's under control, that's gentle the way that he handled. He's bent down one day, and he's writing in the sand, and Pharisees have caught a woman in adultery. He says unto them, Ye which are without sin, let him cast the first stone. There is only one person there that has the authority and the power to throw that stone. That's Jesus. He's the only one. No one else has the right to throw a stone at that woman, but Jesus did. They all leave. He stands now in the presence of this woman, and he says, no man condemn you? And she says, no man, Lord. And he says, with all the power and authority, but in meekness, nor do I go and sin no more. That's the meek Christ. It's not that he didn't, well, he didn't have the power. Oh, no. He has the power. He has the authority. But with that, he uses it for what we're going to see today in three things that I hope that you'll never forget. The meek and lowly Jesus. This is not some Milly Mouse little weakling human being going around Oh, my friend, I believe that I hope that you will see what I have seen in the study of this, that God's glory and power is seen in his meekness and his loneliness. Let's look at three things, if we could, real quick. Number one, he is meek and lowly to show us submission. He is meek and lowly to show us submission. You see, there's no re re resistance here of what God's trying to do. There's, there's no struggle with authority. Now, I could have chosen many different passages to show this, but I chose an interesting one. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Now, you're saying, Brother Scheller, that's the Christmas passage. Well, we're going to go to the end of it. But by the way, before we get to the end of it, talk about him coming into this earth, meek and lowly. I look at... Um, Luke chapter 2, real quick, this isn't where we're headed, but Luke chapter 2 and verse 12, the angels are speaking to the shepherds and they say, and this shall be a sign unto you. Listen to the sign. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Okay, talk about meekness. Talk about humility. First of all, the Son of God came into this earth as a babe. He could have arrived as a king, for that he was. But he shows his meekness and loneliness coming in as a babe. Number two, swaddling clothes. The things that you would wipe the animals with. The things that like bandages. 
talk about meek and lowly, and then a manger? Hey, I will tell you, the Son of God, the eternal God that we heard last week, came into this earth as a babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a feed trough. I'd call that humility. I'd call that meekness to the one who created all of those things. But I want you to go to the end of chapter 2. The Son of God is 12 years old. This is the only passage that we have of Jesus from his birth, being dedicated at the temple, verses before this, until 30 at the wedding of Canaan of Galilee where he begins his earthly ministry. This is it, gang. This is the only passage of Scripture that we have of Jesus from birth till 30 years of age. So I think it's going to show us something. So how, what was he like? How was he meek and lowly as a 12-year-old? How was he meek and lowly as a 16-year-old, as a 24-year-old? What was Jesus like? We have but one passage, but I think it's extremely telling. Luke chapter 2, verse 49. He has been at the temple answering questions because he's the son of God. He knows all the answers. And he didn't lose his deity. So here he has puzzled the doctors with the questions he's confronted them with and with the answers that he has given. Somehow, someway, mom and dad left Jerusalem without their 12-year-old son. Along the way, Mary says, Joseph, have you seen Jesus? No, I thought he was with you. No, I haven't seen him for a couple days. <laughs> I don't understand that whole thing, but anyways, they come back. They see him teaching in the temple. That had to be pretty special. Jesus says these words. And he said unto them, How is it that ye, thought, that ye sought me? Wist knew ye not that I must be about my father's business? I'm doing the Father's will. And now we're going to find out what the Father's will is for the next 18 years of his life. And he went down with them. Help me out here. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was everyone together. What's the next word? Subject. Subject. Unto mom and dad. This is it. This is the only passage we have. So we've got to believe that this was the Father's business, was for Jesus to be meek and lowly, and he showed it in his submission. We are talking about the Son of God obeying a person called Mom and a stepfather, and he obeyed, and he submitted to that. Friend, I will tell you, what shows the meek and lowly Jesus? I believe submission does Submission does not show an act of weakness, but rather control of your will for a greater cause. I know this is really good. Control of your will, like the sprinkler. I am willing to submit to do the Father's will. It's not that I can't do something else, but I am willing to control my will. And when somebody does that, that is not a sign of weakness, my friend. It's a sign of strength. Ladies, if you're married in this room, would you raise your hand? You're married. Ladies, can I talk to you for just a moment? I do not believe that you become a doormat at the moment that you submit to the authority that's over you in that home. I do not believe it is a sign of weakness that when a wife submits to her husband. The Bible says a meek and quiet spirit is, uh, is valuable unto the Lord, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. Here's what I think. I believe, ladies, you are never stronger than when you're willing to take your will and submit and give that will. And by the way, who are you really submitting to? You're submitting to God. You're not submitting to a man. You're submitting to God. And that, ladies, is not weakness. I believe that meek and quiet spirit is your strength as a wife. I will tell you this. A young man or a young woman doesn't go off to boot camp for 12 weeks 
and learn how to submit. And at the end of the submission of 12 weeks, they are weaker. No, my friend, they are soldiers. For now they are stronger than they've ever been. Not because they resisted their authority. No, no. Because they submitted to their authority. We get the concept in our culture today that the more you resist, the stronger you are. The more you stand up for your rights, the greater you are. That's not the meek and lowly Jesus. For Christ shows his strength by his submission. And I will tell you, any soldier that's ever graduated from boot camp will tell you, I'm not a weaker person because of boot camp. I'm a stronger person because I learned how to submit. No Olympic athlete becomes weaker because they've submitted themselves to the discipline of training for that event. They actually, their submission is actually their strength. And I want you to know that we do serve a meek and lowly Jesus, but in no way does that submission that he had on this earth show his weakness. It does not show inactive weakness, but rather the control of his will, greater cause. Look at the second thing. Submission does not show dependence because of a need, but an agreement by an attitude. I did not come to this place because I needed to. I didn't come to this place because I needed to be under Pastor Chapel and West Coast Baptist College. Gang, I came to this place. I willingly submitted, not because of a need of dependence, but because I believe that's what God had called me to. Students came here, not because they had to, but they were willing to submit as well. And even this church. Oh, I think it's so important to understand. Submission does not show dependence because of a need, but an agreement by an attitude. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. It's, Jesus had to learn obedience. How did he learn it? Through the things that he suffered, through the things he submitted to. Large C. Submission shows, I love this, the lamb-like nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love Isaiah chapter 53. It's one of my all-time favorite chapters. And I love this verse. He, speaking of Jesus, prophesied 700 years before. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Here it comes. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Let, let me tell you what I've learned a little bit in life. This thing's got me in a lot of trouble. When I open this thing, and I say something I wouldn't, that's not because I'm a strong person. It's because I have the weakness to tame my tongue. Hey, Christ showed more strength in holy. Can you imagine what he could have said during the crucifixion? Can you imagine the things that, that he could have said with his mouth and all of time would have stopped? But my friend, he was meek and lowly. So he kept his mouth shut for you and for me. You know, it isn't just what Jesus said for us. It's what Jesus didn't say for us that also is very impressive. The large D. Submission shows Christ is more concerned about obedience than convenience. I think of the Garden of Gethsemane here. Again, we see the meek and lowly Jesus. He is praying great drops of blood. He is absolutely in agony. Is there any way that I can redeem man and not be separated from the Father? Is there any way that that can happen? But if not, thy will be done. I know that me submitting and obeying your will, Father, is going to be the best thing. I am not doing this for convenience. I think that's your strength. The meek and lowly Jesus Submission shows that Christ is more concerned about obedience than convenience. That's not our culture today at all. Number one, he is meek and lowly to show us submission. And number two, he is meek and lowly to teach us serving. How does Christ take being meek and lowly and what does he do with it? He teaches us how to serve. Because my friend, when you learn how to serve like Christ served, Meek and lowly, 
You got it. Let's look at, with me, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 13. There's only one other passage I'm going to have you turn to. But I'd like to have you turn to John chapter 13, if you would. In John chapter 13, this is hours before the crucifixion, the night before. Can you only imagine what was on his mind? The Son of God, within hours, will be separated from the Father God. Explain that, I can't. He understands as he sits at the Passover and he takes his hand and feels his beard. He knows within hours that beard will be pulled out. As he serves the meal at the Passover, he looks down at his wrist and he knows soon there will be a mark there of a nail that will be there for all of eternity. The last night he looks down at his hands and not sees the mark. He takes a deep breath. And knows that soon the struggle for breath will be unbelievable. Do you think he could be a little preoccupied? He knows what's going to happen. He's not this Hollywood Jesus that's kind of being tossed and turned by the Roman soldiers and the Pharisees. Jesus knew this before the world was created, what would happen that night. You would think that his mind would be totally on his back being ripped up in a few hours by the cat of nine tails. But now, the meek and lowly Jesus, that he could be so preoccupied with the suffering to come, does something that is absolutely unbelievable. He gets up, takes a towel, and washes the disciples' feet. If there was ever a night, if there was ever a time where he said, Guys, I know you don't understand. I've tried. But you know what? Take my word for it. I'm doing something pretty big for you guys tomorrow. How about washing the feet? Could I at least have that for 33 and a half years? I hope my first night on this earth I was put in a feed trough. And it's been obscurity and it's been this given up. Could you at least wash my feet the last night I'm on this earth? Not Jesus. He's meek and lowly. So what does he do? In his power of character, he washes their feet. That, my friends, is a Savior. That's Jesus. Look with me at John chapter 13 and verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, meek and lowly, to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. But look down at verse 13. You call me master and Lord. (laughs) You say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example of meek and lowly. I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. He is meek and lonely to teach us serving. Christ's meekness allowed him to serve everyone. There's somebody there that night that I am sorry, but if I am going to do the washing of the feet thing, I'm going to do it a little bit later after a guy has left. Because I know what this guy's about to do. He's seen me do miracles. He's heard my teaching. And he's going to betray me for a few pieces of silver. I'm going to do the, I'm going to to wash the feet, okay? But I'm waiting until he leaves. And as soon as he walks out of the upper room, I'll get up and get my towel. Not the meek and lowly Jesus. And you know why? Because Lancaster Baptist, can I tell you something? Everyone has value to Jesus Christ. Everyone has value. And he gets up and he washes 
Judas' feet. Can you imagine that moment? Because Judas knows what he's going to do. And he washes. Christ's meekness allowed him to serve everyone. Look who's in that room, verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. Jesus is, Judas is there when he does this. He is meek and lowly to teach us serving and to allow him to serve everyone. When you become meek and lowly, you don't have your little, okay, well, the church staff, that's kind of up there. And my family and the people I like, they're kind of like up there. Oh, these people, that's not Christ. Meek and lowly means you serve everyone. Large B, Christ's meekness caused him to use authority to serve others. Now, this is it. This is it. This is the essence of meekness right here. This is it. If you look at verse 3 of John chapter 13, it says now, the Father has given him all authority. He's got it now. It's been the Father's will for 33 and a half years. And now the Father says, it's your son. Do what you want with it. You have all authority now. You have all power now. You are it. You are the man. It is all yours now. Folks, you've got to see this. What is the very first thing that Jesus Christ does after he has all authority? He gets up and washes their feet. What does that tell you? That means that the power that you have, the office that you have, the position that you have, I don't care if you're a room leader, you're a Sunday school teacher, I don't care whatever position you have, we just talked about the wives a minute ago about submission. So let's go, dads. Let's go, husbands. Whatever position you have, do you know why you have that position? To serve others. There is only one reason why God has given you that position, and it's to serve. And the meek and lowly Jesus shows us that. The meek and lowly Jesus is able to, at the moment that all things, what a verse, Jesus knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. He didn't lose any power here, guys. He is more powerful on earth now than he has ever been. The Father says, do it. You've got this now. You're in authority now. And what's the very first thing he does? He washes their feet. Christ's meekness caused him to use authority to serve others. Christ's meekness knew no entitlement in serving. So what, what's, what, what, what am I going to get out of this? What, what, you know, like, um, if I'm going to serve like this, so what am I going to get? He got the cross for serving this way. He got the cross. Yesterday, um, we went out. Um, soul winning, and I went out with Rico. And uh, first house, we, Rico and I got out of the car. We started, uh, <clears throat> we were talking about camps and, and preaching at camps and stuff like that. We came up to the first house, and so we were still kind of talking, rang the doorbell. It was not three seconds the door opened. Okay, that does not happen in Lancaster, okay? I mean, normally it's like three minutes, okay? I mean, we rang the doorbell. So, so Rico and I are still kind of talking, and all of a sudden the door opens, and there's a young man standing there. I, I was so startled. I almost introduced myself. Hi, I am Rico, and this is my friend Jim. I mean, it was just like, you know, I mean, it was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I wasn't expecting it so fast. And Alan, 31-year-old young man, he may be here this morning. Alan trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And it was just so really cool just to, just to lead him through the gospel plan. And, and he was so ready. It was like he was standing at the door. Is that guy coming? To save, am I going to get saved today? I mean, it was just, it was about like that. Alan was so ready, but I'm going to share this with you. And if he's here, he'll know. I said, when we got to the sin thing, he, he knew he was a sinner. By the way, mankind knows that they're sinners. But I'll tell you where the struggle gets. And Alan, you deserve hell. And he teared up a little bit. He teared up a little bit, and he said, he, did, he just nodded his head. And I said, do you know, Alan, that you deserve hell because of your sin? He said, I do. I do. Well, you know what? Once a person knows that they deserve hell, it ain't going to be very long before they get saved. I'll just say that right now. 
Once you realize that there's a penalty for your sin and it's going to separate you from God for all of eternity, you're ready to come to Christ. Now let me tell you this. This is, he didn't believe. Christ did not serve for any type of entitlement. If there was anyone that ever deserved, it was Christ. But he didn't serve that way because he was meek and lonely. Large D, Christ's meekness. Ask not what or why, but ask how. How low can you go? I believe at the judgment seat of Christ. See, I think what happens is when we get saved, God gives every one of us a towel. Now, that towel may be a spiritual gift, maybe an aptitude, an ability, but he gives us all a towel. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we hand our towels in. But can I tell you, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not going to be the cleanest towel that's going to matter. It's going to be the dirtiest towel that matters. At the judgment seat of Christ, it's not going to be, oh, Lord, it's still clean. <laughs> yeah, that's not what it's supposed to be. Give me that one that worked in the nursery. Give me that one in the bus garage. Hey, give me the one who's willing to work with those bus kids week in and week out. Give me the dirty towel that they've been having for the last 20 years, 30 years. What does Jesus show us in his meekness and loneliness? He shows us that in our serving, it isn't the clean towel that matters, it's the dirty towel that matters. And finally, number three, and we're done. You say, Brother Shelley, if you got any more object lessons, you're not going to have enough room. No, I'm done with those now. <laughs> number three, he is meek and lowly to show us submission. He is meek and lowly to teach us serving. And number three, very quickly, he is meek and lowly to be our sacrifice. To be our sacrifice. Now, I know it's written there in your, in your bulletin, but if you've got a Bible, would you take it and turn to Zechariah chapter 9? And if you're sitting next to someone that doesn't have a Bible, have them. You see, the prophecies of the Messiah are amazing. This is mentioned hundreds of years before Jesus ever walked on this earth. This is an incredible prophecy, Zechariah. And I know it's going to take you a while to get to Zechariah. So as you're turning that, let me tell you what's going on here. There's two contemporary preachers. They are Haggai and Zechariah. They preached at the same time. They would have done Bible conferences together. And Haggai and Zechariah were preaching about the same thing. But their method was quite different. Haggai was the cheerleader of the Bible. He gets the people aroused. They are in Jerusalem. And they're supposed to be rebuilding the temple. But the temple isn't coming out like it did the first time under Solomon. I mean, all the gold's gone now. They don't have all the materials they used to have and everything like that. And they got the old people. And the old people just cast a whole, a whole blanket on it because the old people remember Solomon's temple. And so the old people are going, it don't look like it used to look. And Haggai says, hey, stop thinking about yourselves. Seek ye, not the, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. You guys are thinking about yourselves. You're thinking about your own houses. You're thinking, and he does a really good job. He really motivates them. He really gets them going. He cheers them up. He peps them up, and he gets them going. Zechariah does something different. Zechariah says, hey, guys, you got to rebuild this temple. Because the second temple is going to be greater than the first temple. Oh, no. That's impossible. This doesn't even look close to Solomon. No. The second temple is going to be greater than the first temple. Because, not the way it looks, but who's coming into the second temple. You see, people in Jerusalem, the Messiah is coming in the temple that you're going to build. So you better get it built pretty quick. So the Messiah can come. So Zechariah does a different motivation. And Zechariah says, gang, we got to get the temple built so that the Messiah is going to enter into this temple. Not going to enter into Solomon's temple. He's going to enter into this temple. So you got to get it built. And in the course of doing that, we come to chapter 9 and verse number 9. This is one of the most sacred holy prophecies of our Messiah in the Old Testament. 
And it says in Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Your king's coming in. But let me tell you how he's coming in. He's not coming in on a big white charger. He's not coming in on a chariot. He's coming in on a little donkey that's never been ridden before because he has power and control over his creation. And he's coming in, Matthew chapter 20, 21 and verse 15, he's coming in meek and lowly. He's going to enter in triumphal entry. And you say, oh, well, I mean, you think if it's going to be a triumph, what, what, what would make it triumphal, Jim? I mean, if you're coming in on a little donkey with some, some peasants putting some palm trees down, how triumphal is that? Oh, it's really triumphal. And let me tell you why. Because he's going to enter in to the eastern gate, riding as a, on a donkey, as the only person that has ever lived in 6,000 years that has never sinned. He will have conquered every commandment, standard, rule. He will have obeyed the law fully, never one time. Triumphal entry? You got that right. He never thought anything, said anything, or did anything that was contrary to God's will. He will be the first person that has ever lived righteously from the beginning to the end of their life. He will be the absolutely perfect person. He has never sinned. That's triumphant for me. I can't make it three hours without sinning. Probably not three minutes. He did it for 33 and a half years. That is a triumphal entry. But not only is it a victorious, his meekness produced a victorious sac uh, sacrifice. This one I like a lot. His meekness produced a vicarious sacrifice. Because folks, he did it for us. He lived that perfect life, meek and lowly. Why? He did it for us. We're the reason why he did this. He took our place. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That entrance into Jerusalem was not only victorious, it was vicarious. But let me tell you, and this is where to go back to the meek, his meekness produced a virtuous sacrifice. He's perfect, folks. There was no sin in him. And then finally... His meekness produced a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus, in his meekness and loneliness, lowliness, enters in to Jerusalem of his own choice. Folks, he volunteered to do what he did for you and for me. The voluntary submission serving and sacrifice of the eternal God, I call his meekness and lowliness in heart. So that's how I define it. Here's my definition of Jesus is meek and lowly. The voluntary submission, serving, and sacrifice of the eternal God. Last week, pastor did an incredible job. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That was God. But this week, we find that God was meek and lowly. Jesus is. Gang, whatever you put in that blank is the most important thing of your entire life. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, up upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of, in heart. Hey, I want you to know, the meekness and loneliness of Christ has so convicted me, 
has so challenged me and so comforted me this past week. This past week, Marilee and I had a little misunderstanding. And um, in the course of trying to get it all settled, she said, you know, Jim, if you just had been a little bit more gentle with me, I think we could have worked this out instead of just kind of being defensive. And I thought, wow, Lord, I'm preaching on his gentleness on Sunday. <laughs> I am so unlike my Savior. But I will tell you, the meek and lowly Jesus has challenged me to say, dear God, and by the way, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, so all I have to do is be full of this Holy Spirit and I'll have meekness. But I want you to know that it's also comforted me because I am so thankful that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ took on human form and still was God. He never lost his power. It just came through a meek and lowly vessel. He's coming back and it ain't gonna be meek and lowly. I want to encourage you, if you don't know Christ, he's humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, for you. Would you receive him today? Would you humble yourself? He humbled himself. Would you humble yourself and say, dear God, I need to receive Christ as my Savior today for what Jesus has done for me. And child of God, I think we ought to reflect our Savior. He's not only the eternal God, he is the meek and lowly God that in our serving and in our submitting, we ought to reflect our Savior.